Well, hello and welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams and I'm here with my co-host, Billy Thomas, and we both work at the University of Kentucky in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources in the Extension uh, Place. And, you know, Billy, since last week, we've had ice storms, we've had snowstorms, we've had more, more snowstorms, and we've had our share of winter weather. And, you know, IDing trees is one of our topics today, and that can really be tough, but the weather isn't the only thing that makes that a hard thing to do, right? No doubt about it. You know, as you mentioned, Renee, it's it's tough right now for a lot of our fellow Kentuckians. Um, a lot of folks are still without power right now. Um, we hope that our, our regular viewers will be able to catch up with us on some of our recordings. But um, yeah, and tree ID is a challenge um, in the winter, for sure. And um, Laurie's going to be talking about that, you know, because we don't really have the leaves and the leaves are one of the easiest things we can use. But um, Laurie's going to help us kind of go over that. Um, and then we're going to be also talking about um, some wildlife sound. Um, I'll save that, that until we get to it. Um, and then we're talking about another big program that we've got coming up real soon. This is a great opportunity if you're interested in forestry and natural resources issues um, and wildlife. This is a great opportunity that we'll be telling you about at the end of the show. So um, we're, we're delighted to have you all with us. If you're joining us via Zoom, please use the chat pod to interact with us. And if you're with us via Facebook Live, you can use the comment section. But um, glad to have you all with us. So um, sit back and enjoy the show. All right, so let's get started with um, Lori. We thank you for being on today and we're not gonna have a tree of the week, right? Because we're gonna, basically this is the tree of the week. You're telling <laughs> about all trees. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So yeah, so today um, we had been, bit, had been requested to have a, a program on winter tree identification, which is always fun and interesting. I will say it's probably, it's challenging and when you're if you've never done any identification before I would really start with the leaves on <laughs> this is not the easiest time to start but we're going to walk through some of the basics of tree identification of deciduous trees so um today we're going to like I said go over some of the basics of winter tree identification and if you again it's fun to start this time of year. Hopefully you've done some of this before though, um, just so you've got some of that, that feel of looking at the different characteristics of trees. So when we're doing winter tree identification, we're really gonna focus on deciduous trees um, in this uh, presentation, in part because we have more, far more deciduous trees in the state than we do of our evergreens or our needle bearing conifers. So when we're starting with deciduous tree winter identification, it's always handy to have a hand lens. So if you've got a hand lens or a magnifying glass, take it out with you because we're gonna be looking at some characteristics that are pretty small on these little twigs, um, not quite as easy as those big leaves. So let's go over just a few of the characteristics that we will be focusing on in winter tree ID. So let's kind of look at some of the parts of the bud. The first one is our terminal bud that we have highlighted up here. The terminal bud um, is uh, where this is where the, this bud's what's gonna make this twig elongate. It's got all that meristematic tissue that allows that twig to grow longer and have um, additional flower buds and additional um, uh, leaf buds in it. So that is our terminal bud. And let me, I want to hide me. There we go, perfect. And then we have our lateral buds and the lateral buds are the ones that are on the side, not at the top. And um, these are from these buds, a side branch can grow. And usually you'll notice that these are found in the leaf axles. So there had been a leaf down here. So it's in, the, in that axle of the leaf. And then we'll look at the bud scale scars. Okay, so these can be good, um, a good identifying characteristic. And these can also be called terminal bud scale scar. So this is where our terminal bud was last year. So this past growing season, this tree has elongated, that twig has elongated that much and set its new terminal bud. And the same over here, there's our bud scale scar there. And that twig has grown that much and set a new terminal bud. And then another characteristic that can be useful in a winter tree identification is looking at the lenticels. And the lenticels are pores that permit gas exchange um, from through that bark into that tree. And len the lenticels can vary in color, can vary in size, and sometimes they're not even present. So those can be good identifying characteristics. We've got a few more. Um, and so the first one, and this is a really good one and it, a lot of great different characteristics that are helpful in IDing um, 
winter trees in winter deciduous trees is the leaf scar and you'll notice these vary depending on species and they're going to vary depending on also the leaf size so this is a maple right here and it has a very narrow um, leaf scar because it's a relatively small leaf but we go over here to this bitter nut hickory which is a larger compound leaf and we have a much larger leaf scar it's almost shield shape and um, so leaf scars are going to vary depending on species and the types of leaves that are on there. So those are really good identifying characteristic. And when we use our dichotomous key a little bit later on, you're going to see there's a lot of questions about leaf scars. Next, you're going to look at the bundle and vein scar. And these are the veins or vascular tissue that carry water to the leaf. And you can see I've got this one's highlighted on this maple. We have three bundle scars and you can see this one real well right there in the center. Since it's a small leaf, there weren't as many bundle or vein scars um, to carry that water to the leaf. But when we come over to this bitter nut hickory, we'll notice there's a whole bunch of bundle or vein scars. And this is where those hand um, lens or your magnifying glass comes in handy. Um, but so you'll see because larger leaf, there are more bundle and vein scars. So another good identifying characteristic. And then last is a stipule scar. And, and these occur in pairs or surround the twig just above the leaf scar. See, there's the leaf scar and it's just above that leaf scar. And not all trees have these. Um, a stipule is just a modified leaf that you'll find at the base of the petiole of that leaf. Um, so not all trees have that, but um, that can be a really good identifying characteristic. And we will see this one a little bit later on. So those are some of the main characteristics that we're gonna focus on um, in winter tree identification while we use our winter dichotomous key. There is another one I did want to mention, and that is the pith. And that's the spongy inner layer of our twigs. And these vary depending on species. So some pits can be round, just like you see in this. So this is a twig we've cut off and just cut a cross section of it. And you can see that round spongy pith. Sometimes they vary in color. The color can be an important characteristic to help you identify it as well. Sometimes those pits can be angled or they can be star-shaped, like our oaks tend to have star-shaped pits. So all of the oaks in the genus will have this more star-shaped pith as opposed to a round pith. And then another characteristic, another way to look at the pith is to actually like cut that twig in half so that you can see the whole pith. And you can see on some species, it's a continuous solid pith. There's nothing different about it. It looks uniform throughout or there can be a chambered pith like this. And you can see all these different little chambers in that pith. Like this is an example, this is a black walnut. They tend to have a chambered pith. Black walnut and white walnut or butternut will have a chambered pith. All right, so then the, when we start our dichotomous key, it's just on with twigs. It's just like when we're doing it with tree ID with the leaves on. We're gonna look to see if our leaves, or in this case, our buds, are all how they are arranged on that twig. Are they arranged opposite from one another, right across from one another? And you see these are right across. You can see these are across from one another. So these are oppositely arranged or are they alternately arranged? So you've got one here and then it's stat as it um, moves up the stem, it's gonna be uh, alternating another twig up here. They're not across from each other, they're alternate. Now, a good thing about trees here in Kentucky, we have, four groups of trees that have oppositely arranged buds and leaves. So that does help narrow it down a little bit for us. Our maples, ash, dogwoods, and buckeyes are all oppositely arranged buds and leaves. So if you can remember the mnemonic mad buck, maple, ash, dogwood, buckeye, you can remember those trees that have oppositely arranged buds and leaves. So when you walk up to your, your um, your tree and you pull down that branch and you're looking at it and if you see I've got oppositely arranged buds you know you've got a maple ash dogwood or buckeye so that kind of helps narrow it down for you and um, all the rest of our trees are alternately arranged and I will say while that's these are groups of trees we have numerous kinds of maple we have several different kinds of ash several different kinds of dogwood and two buckeyes so and um, there's still numerous trees in there but at least it gets you to the genus all right, some other tools for tree identification. And this is the one we're gonna to use today. It's the winter tree finder, and it's for identifying deciduous trees in winter. It is a dichotomous key. And, and we'll go through that in just a minute, but it's a great handy little pocket guide. You can get these from Amazon for about $5. And it is truly pocket size. And um, it's about 75 pages. 
if that, um, and it has about 50 to 60 different kinds of trees and it's great for um, working in the eastern half of the United States. So it's not overwhelming with the number of trees that are in there. Like if we took out one of our field guides that we might have used if you took dendrology or some kind of plant identification in college where it has 700 different species in it or something. Um, another one that a companion that goes with that is the tree finder, the manual for identification of trees by their leaves, also a pocket guide. And this is the one we use a lot for doing our, ba our, our usual tree identification workshops. And this is a dichotomous key based on identifying trees by leaves. There are some websites and I didn't put them on there um, because you all can find them, but Virginia Tech has a great website, um, Virginia Tech Dendro, and they do have a dichotomous key online. They also have an app, but it is, um, it can be, it's very robust. There are hundreds of species of trees in there. So there's a lot to get through. And I think it's always best when you're starting out to make it as easy as possible for yourself. So start out with the fewer, these are the most common trees that we're gonna find. And then there's the iNaturalist. It's a free app that you can download to your phone. And I believe Dr. Crocker has spoken about this in the citizen science segment that she's done. So this is an app you can download and it's not a dichotomous key, but it is an app that you'll take a picture of your twig and then it's gonna give you some options. It's gonna throw up maybe 10 different species. Does your twig look like this, 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 or this? And you'll look at those pictures to see which one looks most like your specimen and for help you with identification. So not a key, but it can be a useful tool as well. All right. so. Let's get started with identifying. So we've gone to our winter tree finder and we have opened it up to the first page where it says, well, where the key starts on page six. The first part of the book has got lots of information on talking about different characteristics of trees. They have diagrams. It's very accessible language, as you'll see in here. It's not overly scientific. Um, I, we use these a lot in 4-H starting in about fourth grade up. So this is a, the type of thing that's very accessible. So since it's a dichotomous key, there's always going to be two statements or questions, and, and it's going to, your answer that or whichever statement works best for you, it's going to send you to two more statements or questions to help narrow down what it is you're trying to identify, what your species is. So when we start on our little book, it says begin here, can't miss that. A lot of times it'll just say start herb, there'll be a number. Um, well, let's read these two first um, statements and see which our twig, this is just a close up, this is a far away picture and a close up of our twig that we're gonna identify. It asks the first one, if the tree is a conifer and needle bearing but sheds its needles in winter, we wanna go to this symbol below. Or if the tree is not a conifer, we wanna to go to this symbol on the next page. Well, if any of you all remember, we covered bald cypress a couple of weeks ago on, as tree of the week. And here you can actually see what the twig looks like of a bald cypress, and it would have that cone on there. And we look at this and this does not look anything like that bald cypress twig. And in fact, we see very prominent um, leaf scars and buds. So we, we don't feel that this is a conifer. So we're gonna go over to the next page and remember that deciduous tree without leaves symbol. It's the top bracket. And now it's gonna ask us about the arrangement of those leaf scars and buds. Remember I said that's gonna be one of those first questions. It's in the same when we're identifying by leaves as it is when we're identifying by buds. So it's asking us if the leaf scars are alternate and look, it even explains to you what it means by alternate and gives you a diagram in case you forget. Or if there are two or more leaf scars opposite each other on the twig gives you a good picture diagram to show you what it means. So let's look at our example here. Those leaf, we can't see the scars on this one, but those buds clearly look opposite. Um, and we can see over here, these look opposite. And then we come to our close up, we can see these buds are opposite each other as are the leaf scars on that twig. So we feel that this is that our leaf scars are opposite. So we're gonna go to this bracket down below, just the next one down and look two more questions. So the first one says, if the leaf scars are whorled, that is if there are more than two leaf scars around the twig at the same level, it is a hardy catalpa. Or if the leaf scars are not whorled, but come in pairs, each one on the opposite side from one another, we wanna to go to page 44. Well, we do not see, we only see two leaf scars, don't we? One, two, one, two, and we only see two buds. We're not seeing three buds. So we are, 
our uh, sample fits this bottom criteria. So we want to turn over to page 44. And it's the bracket at the top where it showed that you had opposite leaf scars. And so now it's asking us a little bit more about our twig, about how big it is, because this can be important. Some twigs are going to be much thicker and bigger, especially if they have big compound leaves than something like a dogwood, which has a very small um, leaf. So it asks if the entire twig is a fourth of an inch or more in thickness and the terminal bud is oval and that means there's just one terminal bud and conspicuous we want to go to the next page or if the entire twig is not a fourth of an inch or more thick or does not have an oval conspicuous does not have one single oval conspicuous bud and let me show you what they mean by that so this is um the oval um bud and that's just the one single bud and when we look at our let's look at our sample our sample is not quite, oh, and by the way, on those tree finders, they have a, a, a little measuring tape on the back. So if you if it's asking you questions about measurements, you've got a ruler handy on the back of your book. You don't have to carry one out in the field with you. When we look here, this is the half inch mark right there. And our twig is not quite a fourth of an inch thick. So it doesn't meet that first criteria. And our bud is not a single terminal bud. In fact, it looks like we've got three up there. So we do not meet the criteria of the first statement. Instead, we meet the criteria of the second statement. So we're going to go down below here. And it says if the terminal buds are rough and dry, and the bundle scars form an almost continuous line on the shield shape or oval leaf scar, it is an ash. So we'd go to the next page. Or the, bot the next statement says, if the terminal buds are not rough and dry and the leaf scars are narrow and inconspicuous with three bundle scars, we wanna go below. So let's come over here and look. Well, granted, we can't feel our what our uh, terminal bud feels like, but it looks kind of rough. You can see there's a texture on that. And then the, the great one here is it has a shield shape definitely a large leaf scar, much larger than this narrow inconspicuous one. And we have a continuous line of our bundle scars. You remember those are the veins that carried the water to the leaf. So we have a nice continuous, looks like a horseshoe shape of those. So we have some type of ash. So it tells us to go to page 46. So let's flip over to page 46. And we went to the ash symbol at the top. Um, and so now it asks us if the twigs are four sided and we can't really answer anything about the bark because we don't have a picture of the bark. We're only looking at the twig here and we don't have the seed because the seeds have already um, they've already ripened and blown away. But I wanted to show you what they mean by a four sided twig. So that example is a blue ash. And if you, you can actually see the ridges on that, it is square. If you rolled that back and forth on your fingers, you could feel the squareness of that twig. Or if the twigs are not four sided, go below. Well, this is not a four sided twig. We don't see those ridges on it to indicate that it is square. In fact, it is a round twig. So we're going to have to follow this symbol down below. And now it's going to ask us one more, ask us another set of questions. It says if the leaf scar is notched at the top so that it is somewhat horseshoe shaped, and then we can't really answer anything about the fruit because we don't have it, but it does. Here's a picture of the bark. Here it says, um, and the bark is ridged forming diamond shaped areas. It is a white ash. Okay, well, let's see what the next statement says. If the leaf scar is a semicircle or oval, we wanna go to the next page. Well, I wanted to show you what a semicircle leaf scar looked like, because I will say ours does not look like a semicircle. It looks notched. We can actually see where the bud um, pokes down in there. And this one that's the lateral bud, you can really see that it is not a, a, a nice, neat semicircle or D-shaped. It looks more U-shaped. This is our sample here. But here's one that does have that semicircle or oval um, leaf scar, and that's the green ash. Okay, so we actually have a white ash here. And so that's a good way to tell these two species apart in the winter is that our our white ash is going to have more of a U or a V-shaped leaf scar, and our green ash is going to have that D-shaped leaf scar. And you can see that nice, I mean, it's a great looking D right there. And then the bark is kind of helps confirm it with that um, the bark is ridged forming diamond with ridged forming diamond shaped areas. And you can see those diamond shapes in that bark, very characteristic of white ash. 
All right, so hopefully we got that. It's kind of, um, see, it's pretty easy to get through when you don't remember things. Um, it explains it. It's got lots of great diagrams for you. You can even see it shows you what the white ash twig should look like. And that looks just like what we have right here. And then it'll show you where the white ash grows and it's native to the Eastern half of the United States. All right, let's try one more. Okay, so we go back to page six again. We've got a new twig. Um, and we can go a little faster now because we've kind of gone through this. Is this tree a conifer or is this tree not a conifer? And we can tell this tree is not a conifer. We don't have little um, places for needles all over it. We've got very, very easy to see conspicuous buds. So we know this is not a conifer. So we're going to follow our deciduous tree um, symbol over to the next page at the top. And now we're going to look at the arrangement of those leaf scars and those buds. Are the leaf scars alternate? or are the leaf scars opposite? Well, we've got a leaf scar down here. So the scar would be right below the bud. And then we move up the twig before we run into another leaf scar. So this would be alternately arranged leaf scars and buds. So this is gonna, we're gonna go to the bottom set of brackets this time. So now it's gonna ask us about the thickness of this twig. Is this twig over a half an inch thick? We wanna to go to the next page. Or if the twig is not over a half an inch thick, we wanna to go to page nine. Well, this twig is not even a quarter of an inch thick because here's our half inch mark and there's the quarter inch. So this is definitely not over a half inch thick. This is a much slender, finer twig than what we would be seeing here that's over a half an inch thick. So we're gonna to go to page nine. We go to page nine, we went, it was the bracket, in case you forget, you can flip back, we're looking for that twig with just the dot on it, we, and that's the bottom bracket here. So now, look, we got a question about pith. So it says if the twig is stout and tough, well, we kind of already just determined it wasn't stout and tough, but um, difficult to break, you all can't tell that because we you're just looking at pictures right now, um, with uh, light colored lentils and tan or brown pith, and if the leaf scars are large, pale, and somewhat heart-shaped, then we would go over to page 36. Or if the twig does not have this combination of characteristics, it needs to have all of those combination, um, that entire combination of characteristics. If it does not have this combination of characteristics, we wanna go to the next page. So let's look at our sample. Let's just start right there with the pith. The twig's been cut in half. We do not have tan or brown pith. We have, it looks green actually. And when we look at our leaf scar, it, it is not heart shaped. It's kind of oval actually. So it does not fit the criteria to go to page 36. It fits the criteria to go to the next page with that little twig symbol. So we go to the, it's the one on the top um, set of brackets. Now it's asking us about our terminal budge. Remember that's the one at the top that's responsible for shoot elongation. And it says if several, if there are several buds of different sizes are clustered irregularly at the tip of the twig, see it gives you a little drawing to show you what it means. Or if the buds are not clustered, we wanna go below. Well, we don't see clustered buds. We see actually one bud up there, one nice um, bud. Actually, it looks valvate, like it's got two, just two scales on it. So we're gonna to need to go to the bracket below. And it says, if there are catkins, and, and you remember catkins are what we would find on a birch tree. Um, looks like little tiny tails or little tiny worms um, uh, hanging off of the tree or if there are no catkins. Well, we don't see any catkins on our twig, so we are gonna need to go to the next page. It looks like it's a three-pronged um, twig there. So we'll go to the next page, and that's the bracket at the top. Now it asks us if there are protuberances on the twig, either thorns or thorn-like twigs, or if there is no, we wanna go to this down here below, or if there are no such protuberances, we wanna go all the way to the bottom bracket. Well, we don't see any thorns or thorn-like twigs on this branch at all, do we? It looks kind of smooth. We've got a nice rounded bud, a rounded leaf scar. So we're gonna go, it fits the criteria to go to the bottom bracket. Now it asks us if there is a line, a stipule scar, remember that stipule scar that goes, it's above the leaf scar and it can be in pairs or can encircle the twig. And this one actually encircles the twig. I'm completely encircling the twig at each leaf scar. We wanna to go to the next page or if there is no such line. Well, we clearly have that line. And this was actually the one we used as the example of showing what a stipule scar was. So we need to go to the next page with that twig that looks like it's got a circle around it. 
and that's the top bracket. And we got, it asks us about our, our leaf scar. Now it says if each leaf scar completely encircles a bud and the buds are brown, conical with only one scale, it's a sycamore. And it shows you what that should look like, a leaf scar that completely encircles that twig. So it's like the it encircles the bud. So it's like the bud sitting in a cup. Or if the leaf scar does not encircle the bud, we want to go below. Well, let's look at our leaf scar. It does not appear to be encircling our bud. It sits below the bud instead of encircling it. So we do not meet that criteria. This is not an American sycamore. So we go down to the bottom to this next bracket and it says if the end bud or the terminal bud is shaped like a duck's bill, it's a tulip tree or a yellow poplar. Or if the end bud is not flattened like a duck's bill, but is large and egg shaped or arrowhead shaped or oblong, it is a magnolia. Well, here, this is a, you can see this picture right here. I would clearly say that looks very much like a duck's bill. In fact, that's one of those things we always say about yellow poplar, the terminal bud looks like a duck's bill. And this is a, a, a two, it has two bud scales and it's a valvate bud scale. So there's just those two on there and it gives it that great look to look like a duck's bill. So we have just identified a tulip tree or a yellow poplar using its twig. And then you can actually compare it to the picture of the twig right here. And that, that even that drawing looks just like what we have right here. Those nice round leaf scars with that little bud tucked up in there and that big um, duck bill like uh, terminal bud. And you can see the the grow the uh, natural range of yellow poplar, the eastern half of the United States. So there we go. We've got through two trees relatively quickly, but I think this is a, a great thing to, if you haven't tried it, to give it a try. Um, get yourself a winter tree finder. Like I said, you can get these from Amazon for about $5. And then go out and try identifying a few. Grab your boots, get your tree finder, get your hand lens and a hat and gloves, especially right now. And, and good luck going out trying to identify trees in winter. Thank you, Laurie. We greatly appreciate that. Yeah, that was great, Laurie. Um, you, you taught us how to fish, right? Instead yeah, of giving us the say, tree of the week. <laughs> and we got it done in a little over 20 minutes. That's pretty good. Usually yeah. the free ID one's a solid 50 minutes long. So sorry it was a little fast, but that's okay. Uh. So one thing, content. question we do have is the invasive honeysuckles have opposite buds. Is there a quick way to distinguish these undesirable plants with any of the mad bucks that you talked about? Um, well, uh, since honeysuckle is more of a shrub, it's going to be multi-stemmed and our trees usually are not. Occasionally we have some that are multi-stem, but since honeysuckle is a shrub um, and it, it can get quite large sometimes. One good distinguishing characteristic is a honeysuckle, if you break off or snap off one of the twigs, it's going to be hollow inside. Whereas our trees that are opposite will not be hollow inside. Okay. So hopefully that helps. That was one of those things that we learned as we were removing, when I worked in parks, we removed honeysuckle. So. <laughs> uh. Someone says, if you don't have a hand lens, tap on the home button of the iPhone three times. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it, it creates a little zoom feature. So it basically oh, uses the camera to zoom in on what you're looking at. Uh -huh. Good to know. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Yeah, good tip. Wow, that is very interesting. Yeah, because not everybody has a hand lens handy. They're, I mean, Bye. they're not super expensive, but or a, a magnifying glass for that matter. So that's great. You're out and you just want to do it real quick. Wonderful. Thank you for that tip. Um, all the every tree has a bud right and so is that correct or because you're always looking for that bud right yes now now all trees will have terminal buds though so some will have pseudo terminal buds that actually fall off but you will have you will see lateral buds on the tree so, but you got to look closely sometimes they are very small and they will be smushed up against the twig like when you look at red buds red bud has a very small um, and yeah, it's a very fine twig anyway, and it has a very small bud. The same with um, our, um, with uh, dogwood, I was trying to remember what it was, with dogwood, the same thing. So you have to get that magnifying glass and look closely. But like I said, not all trees have terminal buds, but they'll have the lateral buds. Sounds good. All right, Lori. Well, thank you very much. We greatly appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, great segment. Really great segment. Appreciate it very much.
All right, so moving on, we have a wildlife sounds and yeah. um, Dr. Matt Springer um, will be talking about that. And we did record this previously. So I just wanted to let people know that um, if it does, you know, if it says something about now or whatever, it may not be necessarily <laughs> be now. Um, so uh, Matt's on if he wants to talk a little bit about the video. Yeah, so this is definitely a, an older recording given what our outside looks like currently. Um, so I don't think we'll be hearing this sound uh, probably for at least a couple more weeks. Um, but it is one that is um, commonly heard, especially um, spring, summer, and fall uh, in basically all of Kentucky. Welcome to another edition of Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. Again, we have Dr. Matt Springer with us, and he is an Assistant Extension Professor of Wildlife Management, and thank you for being on the show again today. Good morning. Glad to be here. So what's the new sound of the week? <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see. I, I, I was tell, as I was telling you earlier before we started recording this, this was driving me nuts this weekend, uh, but... Uh, if you're out in the woods, especially right now, or potentially in your backyard, you may be hearing this sound quite a bit. So let's, uh, I'm going to share my screen here okay. and we will see. So let's listen to our clip. Any guesses? Is that Chip or Dale? Ah, now you're <laughs> giving it away. So since she gave that clue, might as well go right to our actual answer. So Renee, you are correct. It's the Eastern Chipmunk. Good. So um, um, are they everywhere? Since they're Eastern, what does that mean exactly? Well, so they, their range extends uh, down through the Appalachian Mountains, um, up northeast, northern part of the country into Canada. Um, we have, um, basically there's two chipmunk species in North America. Now there's a bunch of ground squirrel species, uh, but this is our only chipmunk species we have in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, these guys are relatively small. Uh, most folks will see them. I mean, when I was in Lexington, I had them uh, running through my backyard almost on a, a, a basically every five minutes one was running across my patio. Yeah, they uh, so scurry a lot. <laughs> they, they scurry quite a bit. They're really common. When they're around, they're really common. Um, they're rodent, so they're, they uh, reproduce pretty quickly. Uh, and actually, they, they can live up to five years, uh, but most don't live past a year. They're, they're pretty low on the, the food chain. Um, so how many babies do they have? You said they reproduce, so... So they'll have anywhere from three to five uh, babies in a litter, um, usually in the spring. And there, there's possibility for multiple litters in a year mm -hmm. uh, for mom, uh, depending on food availability, health, and you know, weather, those kind of things. And, and the further south you go, the more the chance you have of having multiple litters in a year. Um, but these guys are uh, definitely ones that can cause problems in, in, mm -hmm. for us in landscaping. Uh, they are burrowers, so they create their own tunnel systems, mostly to avoid predation. And that sound we heard is actually the sound that they use to alert other chipmunks of a potential ground predator or a hawk, uh, mm. owl. Um, so these guys are on the menu for all of the above, um, mm. unfortunately for them. Um, and, you know, snakes are also a big predator for them uh, and will actually go into their burrows after them. Um, whereas the other ones are um, not able to necessarily go after them into the burrows. Coyotes may actually try to dig or foxes dig out their mm -hmm. burrows to see if they can get down to it, but their burrow network is pretty intensive uh, and um, they'll actually store some of their food in it uh, for the winter or they'll cache it in other places uh, in their territory. Do they hibernate? They do. So they go into a torpor. Um, so similar to squirrels and many of our other small mammals, uh, these guys will go into a couple weeks worth of sleep and then they'll wake up um, and look for some food that they have cash, consume it, and then go back to sleep. So it, it kind of the weather when they wake up kind of dictates how long they may stay awake. So if it's really cold, uh, they may go right back into sleep after eating a little bit. Uh, but if it's a nice, you know, if we, we get those little spurts of, of warmer weather, they may stay out and active because they can find enough food to keep their metabolism going and stay warm. Uh, but in northern areas in Canada, these guys are known to dig through upwards of over a meter of snow 
to get out and active uh, okay. when they wake up. So that's a, that's pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, what's the difference between digging through ground and snow really? Yeah. I guess snow would actually be easier. <laughs> Probably <laughs> colder, maybe. No colder, gloves on those definitely chipmunks. colder. Yeah. So what do they eat? So these guys eat a lot of um, mast, so soft and hard mast, right? So acorns, uh, berries, mm-hmm. uh, fruits. Um, so if they have uh, access to uh, your apple tree, they will definitely eat some of your apples um, for sure. Uh, other seeds from smaller uh, plants, um, you know, many of our pollinator mixes, they'll consume, you know, coneflower seeds and, and so uh, sunflower seeds. Um, and the sunflower species, not necessarily the one that we consume, but the smaller native varieties, they'll consume those seeds. Uh, mushrooms, they'll actually eat bird eggs if they find them. Uh, earthworms. So they, they have a pretty diverse diet uh, representative of, you know, a lot of things that are found on the ground. Right. Are they good climbers like squirrels are? They can climb. They choose to be on the ground more than they do climb, but they are capable at climbing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had them run across my roof before, so oh. that one definitely reassured that check mark of, <laughs> there of being you go. able to get places. Um, and then these guys are pretty territorial as well. Um, so those burrow systems, they'll they'll defend them uh, from other animals, and and generally their their territory tolerance for invaders is based on food availability. So if it's a good mast year. Mm-hmm. They'd be much more tolerant of someone coming in and taking an acorn from that territory than say a poor year when food is limited, they're going to be much more defensive of that. And that sound that we heard is, is one that you may actually hear when they're, they're yelling at their neighbor. Well, that makes sense. Anything else we need to know about chipmunks? Not that I can think of. I, that's more than I uh, generally knew about them for <laughs> quite a while. So. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us today. We greatly appreciate it. No problem, Renee. Glad to be here. Those are enjoyable, Matt. Really appreciate you and Renee putting those segments together. It's a lot of fun to kind of um, hear these animals before you kind of see them. Um, So appreciate you all's work on that. I saw there's a couple raised hands and then uh, there's the one question about, is that a mating call? Um, I think we got, you know, that um, sound there is uh, either predation warning or warning about predators being around and that, or, uh, a uh, don't don't step on my lawn kind of uh, alert uh, to uh, if they're you know neighbors. So do they eat bulbs like the bulbs you plant? Yes. Yeah, uh, I figured. I, I planted a hundred bulbs one time, and I literally have none that have popped up, and we have chipmunks. So. <laughs> <laughs> are they good fat chipmunks they over are. there? <laughs> yes, and um, I had a, a very um, bad experience with them personally trying to grow sunflowers you know the the large mammoth sunflowers in my yard for birds uh they wouldn't let a single sunflower plant get uh larger than like six inches so they they kept trimming it off right that you know right as the new growth came up they were they were chowing down on it um and uh is that Lori that said i think this sounds like yellow bill cuckoo um we won't uh, throw any uh, birders uh, under the bus <laughs> abilities to determine if it's a bird or a mammal, <laughs> I guess. Um, well, there, I saw there are two other hands. Is there any other questions or? You can type them in the chat pod if you have any questions. Must not be. If so, yeah. Matt will uh, try to get you back on to answer that question. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. We greatly yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Great segment, guys. Thank you very much. All right. we got All a right. we got a big program coming up, Renee. Yeah, we do. It's yeah. the Ohio uh, River Valley Woodlands and Wildlife Workshop, and uh, Lori Thomas is back on to tell us a little bit about that. Right. Yeah. Thanks. I will. And um, so yeah, the Ohio River Valley Woodlands and Wildlife Workshop is a partnership with um, University of Kentucky Ohio State Extension and Purdue and in Indiana Extension um, programs, forestry and natural resource extension programs. We do this every year. Normally it's held in person and it rotates from state to state. Last year it was supposed to be in Kentucky. We usually hold ours at, in Boone County at the Enrichment Center up there um, in Lacey. And then we were so excited last year. Um, and then this year we're, we're gonna do it virtually, but then um, hopefully next year in the, towards the end of March in 2022, we'll be able to be in person again and we will be at the Boone County Enrichment Center. Maybe third um, times charm. <laughs> yeah, and I was gonna say third times a charm. 
but this year we are holding the um, meeting virtually and it's a great uh, one day event. Normally we usually have 15 talks, but since it's gonna be held virtually via Zoom, we narrowed down some of the talks a little bit. And um, let me take you to the agenda so you can see. Okay, so here's our agenda for the day. Okay, so um, we it is on the 27th of March and it starts at, which is a Saturday, it starts at 9 a.m. And we have talks um, that start at 9.15. Uh, the first one is, Are My Woods Healthy? Assessing the Health of Your Woodland. And then we'll have another talk at 10.15, The Value of Your Woodlands. We have a break, you can lunch, grab a coffee for a little bit. We've got 45 minutes to kind of take a little break and then we'll get back together again at noon for common habitat management practices to benefit game species in the Ohio River Valley. And then we'll have another talk on non-game wildlife habitat hints. Um, and then we'll, we end at two with questions and evaluations. And this is the opportunity for you all to ask questions, maybe to all of the presenters or about some of the other resources you might have viewed before you set in on the meeting, because we have a resources page. If you click over on resources, so each state has put together a series of resources. These are mostly videos on the topics that we're covering, forest health, wildlife, both game and non-game, and also with um, and the value of your woodlands. We also have thrown in tree identification in there as well, all of the states, because we all do it a little differently. So check them out. Um, but we've got winter tree ID and summer tree ID as well videos up there. So you can just click on the state. So like if I clicked on UK's on Kentucky's right here, you'll see some of our videos that we have posted that you can preview before you come to the um, to the event on uh, March 27th, or you can even watch them afterwards as well. So if you're interested in the um, program, you can go over to the register button and there's a tab there, click to register. It's a Qualtrics and just ask a few questions. And it's a free program this year since this is gonna be, 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 be held via Zoom. And we do hope that you can join us. And I, for the our agents that are in on our uh, show today, listening in, and this will be up in CURS for a CURS credit, hopefully by next week. So you all can sign up for this program and get CURS credit as well. So hopefully you guys will join us on March 27th for the Ohio River Valley Woodlands and Wildlife Workshop. It's, it's a great event, lots of good information um, that you, you'll get in a, in a virtual manner this year and that maybe you can join us in person next year in Boone County in 2022. You know, maybe one thing that they're interested in is that they can actually kind of get a feel for what it's going to be like this year. And then next year, um, typically when we do this, Lori, we have three different events going on at one time, three different classes. So you go to whichever class you feel like you want to pick from. And I know a lot of times people are like, oh, I really wanted to go to, you know, this one and that one at the same time. Well, this year they won't have to pick. Right. Um, yeah. So that's one good thing about having it virtually. Right. Yeah, they don't have to choose this year. Um, hopefully next year we will be in be able to be in person. And like you said, we run those concurrent sessions. Um, and um, but yeah, hopefully this will be it'll be a good it's not a very long day, but a lot of great information is going to be packed into those talks, those four talks this this year. Right. Yeah, we dropped the um, link to that page that Laurie was showing you into the chat pod. Please um, use that and share it with others. As Laurie mentioned, it is a free program and a great opportunity to get a lot of great content. And if you have other questions, you'll have a group of um, presenters that should be able to address most questions. So um, please take advantage of this and spread the word about it. Definitely. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Laurie, for uh, thank you. presenting for us. Yeah, no doubt. Oh, Renee, another good show. We covered some good topics in a very frigid day here in Kentucky. Yeah, um, you know, uh, me too. Our, outside on my yeah. porch, you know, so it's our, very cold. you know, I, I saw some of the damage across on the internet. You know, some of our maple syrup producers had some serious damage, and I know a lot of the other woodland owners and individuals out there. So, our you know, our hearts and thoughts go out to all of them, and I hope you all have a speedy recovery. Um, from this um, ice storm damage for sure definitely and definitely take care because i think we're in for another round tonight so yeah it looks like we're going to get a little bit more so um take care of yourselves take care of each other and um, we hope to see you all next week um at 11 o'clock on from the woods today till then take care bye bye everybody thank you much <laughs>